climate, you know, one way to look at it is kind of the world's largest collection of risk or the world's largest network, world's largest system that we are all in the patterns that connect, it connects us all. We, nobody in the world escapes weather, except I guess the guys in the, in the space station, International Space Station, they get to just look at it. Um, we know a lot about weather. We know a lot more than we used to. We've got tons of technology out there in every piece of ocean, every sky, every place. We've got vast powers of computing at work on the problem of trying to figure out what's going to happen with it. And yet, for all that, we don't know a whole lot, but we do know, and this is, we're starting to get to that chart that you can see over there. Oops, we've got a real big flaming fireball coming through the subject of the world's climate, popularly known as climate change, global warming, take your pick. Very evidently, you know, people, I guess Hurricane Sandy this year, put a kind of point on it that extreme weather is becoming the, no the new normal, if you like. So we brought together a group here to talk about this from a multiplicity of angles. And I'll start with the, our most distinguished member, the president of Iceland, Olaf. Next is Johannes, who is the head of the European Climate Foundation, which does, it's the largest climate advocacy and research funding group in the world, headquartered in Brussels, does lots of good work with businesses, political groups, leaders, etc. Ernst Rausch from the hometown, he's the home team from Munich Re, world's largest reinsurance company, which means they insure the people that insure us. And so they have an extremely lively interest in all kinds of catastrophes. Um, the, bigger the, the bigger it is, the more they worry about it. And that's why, so we're, we can all be happy that he's there. And then lastly, David Kenny, my good friend from the Weather Company in Atlanta, Georgia. And contrary to popular belief, it is not really a television station, although it does that, but it's actually the world's biggest provider of prediction information to businesses, media, everybody around the world. So even if you're not watching the Weather Channel, you are probably benefiting from the information that comes from the Weather Channel. And they obviously do that in concourse. So that's our group. Um, I wanted to kick things off with this really cool chart, which Johannes was kind enough to put together, which shows you different emissions pathways uh, in, in terms of policy. And everyone loves to talk about carbon control. This shows you, but what this really, what, what we like about this chart is there's several paths now that take you down to basically no climate change. You can forget about those. I mean, Johannes will go through it a little bit better. We're in the red zone now, kids, and you can see on the right-hand side the list of evil effects. And I mean, why don't I turn it over to Johannes and just, I mean, just where are we now in that? Well, let me try to baseline the discussion like uh, climate science in, in 60 seconds. So what, what basically the International e Energy Agency, I mean, these are not your typical tree hugger types, right, say is we are on track for a 60 degree world by the end of the century. And so that translates into the black line that you see on this chart, which means by the middle of the century, some 3.4 degrees um, expected increase if nothing changes. Now, if a lot of things change on the political side, um, we may just about make it to two, a little bit above two degrees. Um, that's the second line. But that assumes a lot of political change. Um, global deals, carbon prices, all of these things that you read about that haven't really materialized yet on scale. Um, what the science is basically telling us, and that's firming up more and more, is not only is the, the warming as such real, but also the man-made contribution of it is being firmed up as a real risk. And the real kind of scientists um, that work on this all the time, and we are talking not just about a few, but 99.9% .9 of all peer-reviewed articles, they say, look, you are a crazy world to accept a risk of two degree, because that means you're already in for real issues with food production a lot of extreme weather events. You're getting very close to tipping points where actually our models don't know where it'll go to. It can become um, a system out of control. So basically what the, the scientists tell us, you, if you want to be safe, if you want to be responsible as humanity, you have to at least get down to 1.5%. But that means 
in a world of growth, where China is growing, where India is growing, where everybody is building the prosperity on growth, we would have to reduce emissions massively, already now, leading into 2050, and that is obviously a non-trivial challenge. Um, let me just dial back a little bit. I mean, that's a kind of theoretical chart. Um, Ernst, are we seeing, I mean, is this showing up in the insurance numbers? I mean, that's a really basic fact. Are we already seeing what that chart predicts? Um, yes, we do. We, we, we're analyzing losses from natural disasters uh, back in the 1970s already. And uh, if you look at our data, they clearly tell us that over the last 30 years, and here's the graph, over the last 30 plus years, the number of weather-related disasters worldwide has almost tripled. Uh, we started at around 400 catastrophes a year in the 1980s, and today it's around 1,000. Um, and we also see, and that's the, the red bars, is that the geophysical events like the earthquakes, no change has been observed over the last 30 years. And this increase in frequency with weather-related disasters, that's a strong indication that Mother Nature already has changed, and this is very likely linked to global warming. So, David, I mean, you guys deal with this every day, literally every day. Tell us a little bit about the relate. I mean, there's been this ongoing, you know, weather versus climate. Okay, there's been a you know, people for years have been saying every time there's a storm, one bunch of people says, "Oh, look, it's global warming," and another bunch says, "Oh, no, it's not. It's just a storm." And then, conversely, when it's really hot, everybody says, "Oh, it's global warming." And then, when there's a cold snap, everybody goes, "So much for global warming. There it is." It's, I mean, how do you guys, as a public, now we'll talk about two halves of your business. One is the difficulty of predicting, especially climate, and then secondly, how do you play that out to a public that may not be amazingly sophisticated? So, for, first of all, there's the science. Um, climate is, on average, over time, what's going on in a specific area. Weather is a fluctuation around that. The misnomer is, as the climate gets warmer, that doesn't mean the weather always gets warmer. As the, cl as the climate gets warmer, there's actually greater fluctuation. And the concern, of course, is as we continue to move up, um, the warmer it gets, the, the more fluctuation there is, and that's the more extreme weather. So um, I, I would say we're, we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the science because it's harder and harder to predict. We're getting to the point where everything we've known in the past doesn't necessarily apply by, because by the science. Back. What does that mean? Does it mean computers, sensors? What 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 are, what's the what's the what makes this all? Yeah. Go? So the the way you predict the weather is with algorithms, like okay. search. So okay. um, you're predicting the wind all the way around the the Earth, and uh, so you're running literally hundreds of thousands of simultaneous equations. And the faster you can produce those, the more depth you can put into those, the more data points you put in those, the better we get. And we are getting better at predicting weather at the same time because the climate's changing. It, well, that's, it that, yeah, that was, I, was, I was curious, is, is, is predictability going down? No, I, 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 we're, we're finding over, we're actually finding we can keep predictability up. Um, and, and some of it's getting really smart about not just measuring what's happening on the earth, but knowing better about what happens in the atmosphere. We've done this for years because we do weather for aviation. Um, but, but actually you can see the climate change in the atmosphere more quickly than you can see it on the Earth. So we're, we're get, getting better predicting atmospheric ridges and how that predicts Now, how about, again, the, back to my question about the, the, um, the, the public perceptions. I mean, again, you're dealing, you an audience. Yeah, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the audience? Well, the that's, that's the problem. So um, the, the Weather Channel itself, our own, our own properties reach 168 million people every week. And then we've got another 200 million people we're reaching some of which are the other 200 million people we're reaching through local broadcasters and other, okay. other sites we support and other broadcasters we support. So it's mass. And I would say the climate discussion has largely been an elite discussion. I would say your average farmer, your average truck driver, your average taxi driver, your average mother, this is a little bit obscure. They want to know the weather today. They want to know the weather next week. So part of what we're trying to do is help connect. Sandy was one thing, and New Yorkers are very New York-centric. The drought, the drought actually affected more people and is a bigger the drought, issue. By the way, that would be the drought in the Midwest of the United States, which even most Americans that don't live in the Midwest probably are not aware of. Or the weather today in Europe. So we're trying to connect 
everyday weather events, and particularly things that are catastrophic and costing people a lot of money, to what's going on in the climate over time. Because the only way we're gonna get citizens or voters to apply any political pressure is they can connect it to what's happening right now. I think, I think the other thing we're trying to do is make sure people do not just view climate change as something in the future. It already happened. It's continuing to happen, but we can, we can show enough catastrophic events and the moment to have people understand a change is needed. Olaf, as somebody who's in the public domain and dealing with the question of public perceptions, I mean, how do you, what do you see is that's being done right and wrong by, I don't know whether I want to say the political establishment or the elite that David referred to in terms of getting people to understand this in a sophisticated way? Well, it all depends which part of the world you're talking about. The paradoxical situation now is that in many Asian countries, including China, there is a much stronger awareness and more activity in order to increase the understanding of relationship between the melting of the ice and extreme weather than is being done in the United States or even Western Europe. It's kind of paradoxical for me as a president of a European country, a there in the North Atlantic to be cooperating more ac actively with China on these issues in the last four or five years than with the United States and Europe. And in order to create a shift to prevent what we saw here on the chart, I think we have to realize in the Western world that we are the problem because to give you a concrete evidence of what I'm talking about. In the summer of 2007, the Arctic sea ice was at its lowest. And in the following winter, there were severe weather events uh, in China that caused destruction of uh, railway lines and uh, electricity networks and food production. So the Chinese leadership acknowledged the close relationship between weather patterns in China and what's happening to the ice in my part of the world. So two years ago, in my meetings with Hu Jintao and Wen Xiaobao, we agreed that the Chinese Polar Institute would send the icebreaker Snow Dragon last summer through the northern route close to the North Pole, directly from Shanghai to Iceland, the first time in history this was being done, with about 60 Chinese scientists on board studying the melting of the Arctic sea ice. So we now know, of course, that last summer the Arctic sea ice was at its lowest ever. What's happening these very weeks in China? It's not being covered by the European press very much. It's not being covered very much in the American media. It's the worst weather that has happened in 40 years in the northern part of China, with enormous destructions for millions of people and e economic consequences far more severe than Storm Santi produced in the United States. We have become so western orientalized in this debate that, first of all, we don't realize the kind of partnership leading countries like China are offering to us, and we are not understanding the consequences of what's happening in our part of the world for our own weather. Uh, Michael Bloomberg was probably the only political leader in the United States who aggressively acknowledged the consequences of Storm Sandy for the climate change debate. So, what makes me hopeful is, first of all, that the severe weather events have created a bigger understanding of the relationship between the melting of the ice and the weather. And to some extent, politically, it would be more convenient to drop the term climate change, to uh, drop the, uh, this whole warming discussion, and simply concentrate on extreme weather patterns and what's happening in the Arctic, in Antarctica, and in the Himalayan glaciers. This will make the debate very concrete, uh, very realistic, and purely science-based. But our board, we have to be ready in Europe and the United States to start actively cooperating with China, India, and the other leaders in Asia who now have got to a crossroad in this that nobody believed would happen to the five, uh, f five years ago. Ernst, you were just in China recently, I think you said, but you had a, tell us about your experience there with 
discussing this with the Chinese? Yeah, uh, well, me meeting with, with our Chinese business part partners, uh, my, my perception is that they fully understand the dimension of the problem. They have absolutely no doubts about the scientific research and the findings of the scientific research, and they are prepared to act. But one of the biggest challenge is that China has to show and demonstrate significant economic growth, also in order to avoid social unrest and other internal problems. And that's, that's the big challenge to China. They look for technologies, technologies which come mainly from industrialized countries, from the United States, from Europe and other regions, technologies which avoid carbon dioxide emissions, uh, like in the energy sector, renewable energies and others. So if we could team up, if we could become partners in this sector, I think then that would create a win-win situation both for China itself and for the demand to grow and for us here in, in Europe and the United States as well in technology countries. Yeah, to, to just pull the two together, there, back to this patterns that connect, there's a real need to connect globally. The weather is not local. Everyone thinks it's local. The extreme weather is very, very global. Our meteorologists and climatologists in June said, David, there's going to be a bad storm in the fall <laughs> because the sea ice is at its lowest level. The sea ice will be completely gone in the summer within 10 years. That means whatever we see this year, we'll see three, four times the effect within the decade. Not sure where, right? And th right. This, this cooperation globally on the science, this transfer of intellectual property, we're going to have to get over ourselves in the data front because the, the extreme weather is all connected. It was a lot, things happened in Alaska that affect New York, and things happened in Alaska that fit, affected Beijing just in the last six months. I think it's very um, encouraging to see a lot of cooperation on the science side, and you see that. I mean, that's happening. But the real question is, um, it's not about the science, it's about the economies. It's about global competitiveness. Who is moving first to a low-carbon economy at what cost? Because the ultimate question is, if we are doing something now, will it basically uh, pay off long term, even in other nations, um, or will it kind of pay up, uh, pay um, out in the time span of a politician here and now? And that's that's the wicked nature of the problem that you don't usually get re-elected for basically doing something on the policy side that benefits the people in Bangladesh. You know, if you you do something for your own children, you tend to get re-elected. Now, how basically, that's the challenge also for basically information architectures, how can we make it relevant for the here and now, what is happening globally? Because that is ultimately the challenge. It's a globally connected world. The impacts will happen in other places, um, but the causes are often disconnected in, in the sense that you cannot kind of like connect our emissions now to the impact in the here and now. There'll be a lot of steps before you kind of like basically have that cycle reach you and hit your back. Well, for reasons, yeah. well, well, here we come to what I believe is one of the key challenges. We have heard today, just a few minutes ago, about how information technology enables us uh, to get a taxi quicker and to give us all kinds of information in our daily lives. So now we need to get the IT community to produce apps and, uh, and uh, tools on our phones that directly communicate to individuals all over the world exactly what you were saying. That three or four months before the storm happened in New York, the scientific information and pre the prediction of the risk was actually available. In the same way as in my country, we can predict earthquakes now uh, sort of reasonably well. So we need to engage the IT community and inspire it to give us products, like they do of the commercial products that have been described here, of the, uh, of the scientific evidence, whether it comes from China or the US, that communicates to people in their homes, in the streets, what will happen in a few months later. And I believe if, if we can connect the IT community with the scientific community on the weather and the ice, we could transform the public awareness in an extraordinary way. And the second dimension of that would be also to communicate the great number of fascinating things that are being done in the field of clean energy uh, in many parts of the world, especially uh, in uh, the non-European and the non-US uh, part of the world, 
unless we can galvanize the IT community to come into this in a very active way, it will be very difficult to get the political decision making that is necessary to prevent what you were describing in the beginning. So I urge everybody here, one of the reasons why I came here now is to give this message that now is the time for the IT community to come into this with the scientists and with some of us and really make this a, a global awareness in the same way as you made Facebook and Twitter and, and the rest of it uh, a part of our everyday life. We need to make the extreme weather and the awareness of the ice uh, a every, a com a awareness of, of people all over the world. I mean, is it time for what I'll just call a scare campaign on a global basis? That, I mean, you know, right now, lots of advocacy groups are out there with pictures of the polar bear no, on no, standing No, 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 this is not a scare campaign. This is just a distribution no, I mean, of the fight. No, but, no, I mean, I, mean, I mean really the kind of thing that people do when they're confronted with a real emergency or a war is to scale up the public relations aspect of it and just say, hey, guys, because we've been very polite about it. I mean, you know. Yeah, but I don't think this scare is going to work. I, I, with I'm all, just asking hypothetically. Uh, no, because, I mean, if, if I just go back to... To, to my situation in Sandy. Um, f first of all, 10 days before, our head scientist said, it's a very high probability that this storm will go up and turn left. It will likely hit New York, flood the subways, maybe close Wall Street, and then it will become a blizzard. It will happen on Halloween when it's at full moon. So I'm like, Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to go on the air and say, because of climate change, God's punishing Wall Street, closing no, the no. subways. And, and you, it's media hype, right? You no. have to really find a way to help people understand probabilities. No, but that's not, that's not what I was talking about. I wasn't about weather hype. I meant which people do. Well, that's what's do. scary. Is no, but I mean, in other words, a really big global campaign that just says, by the way, here's the future. Take a good look at it. And... Well, kind of campaigns are our business, right? And um, what we've learned is fear doesn't work. I mean, fear is basically not a good campaign tactic normally. I mean, the psychology works like that, that people, if they're really afraid, they come from the Midwest, they are part of the Tea Party, whatever, they say then the science must be wrong, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, your beliefs, your fundamental beliefs are always stronger, um, even than the biggest fear, number one. What is kind of more rational, after all, is how investors view risks. And I think that is the campaign um, we need to engage on. How do we value in the balance sheet fossil fuel reserves? Um, the thing is, if you take the science even remotely serious, we will not take all the oil, gas, and especially coal out of the ground. However, if you look what is in the balance sheet of the corporations, in the pension funds right now, 40% of the value of the FTSE assumes we will go onto a 60 degree path, right? So that is the real lever, and that I think is campaignable. And so, in other words, disinvestment, is that what you're saying? Well, no, it basically means adjusting investment strategies. Pension funds not going into it, and it would be interesting to hear how you are investing as Munich Re. I mean, is, is, that, is that, I mean, I know there are like American universities, there's been some recent stuff that they've pulled investments from fossil fuel companies. Is this something that the insurance industry would conceivably get behind? Uh, that's already actually happening. Uh, insurance companies who are typically large investors in the, in the capital market have started uh, investing significant amounts in new technologies like renewable energies. Right. And all of these investments go into what we would call clean technologies, low carbon or carbon free technologies. Munich Re, for instance, uh, we have a program that we want to invest some two and a half billion euros over the next couple of years in renewable energies and new technologies and another half, one and a half billion in other infrastructure uh, programs. So the insurance companies know very well that uh, they also have to adjust their investment strategies. And that's simply based on the fact that our role as an industry right. is to identify risks, to be kind of an early warning uh, system in our industry, measure the risks, and finally, just as you said, put a price tag on the risks. And based on this, we also adjust our it, investments. Is it imaginable that you guys would run those kinds of numbers and conclude that it was time to send a message to the fossil fuel companies by selling their stocks? Well, I gave a speech at Shell headquarters and, and I said, look, you are a stranded asset industry, right? They didn't like that. 
Um, at the same time, um, that it becomes a question of societies, which values do they put to certain um, priorities? I mean, do we basically accept that level of risk, especially also that level of hardship hitting in other places of the world? Are we willing to live with that? Are we cynical in all of that? Then, okay, the business model may be sustainable. If you only say no to one of these questions, then basically Shell will have to get out of a lot of the business they are in right now and transform their business model. We all know transforming business model is not easy, but the interesting thing is in the IT and let's say publishing industry, we've seen this happening and it's still ongoing. And I submit that we will see the same thing in the energy industry. We will see a convergence of IT and electrons. Uh, we will see yield management. We will see new forms of um, capacity and capability markets. And they will drive out some of the fossil fuel business models. The thing is, they will not like it and they'll fight it tooth and death. So this is a battle between business models and you can assume it will not go without a fight. But I think if we start looking at how we plan our cities and we can engage the people who decide the development of the cities and we believe the science and we believe what the insurance companies are saying, we can have a pretty de constructive dialogue with mayors and city council people and experts all over the world that they have to start preparing to move part of the cities away from the coastline they have to uh, change completely their 2030 vision of how the city will develop. And this will cost an enormous amount of money. I think this whole excuse about the Tea Party and the Republicans, I mean, it's all a lot of nonsense. Because in reality, it's our cities in Europe, it's cities in Asia that already have to plan for the rising sea level of one or two meters, not to say five or ten and what that will do to the future planning of the cities. These are concrete decisions that have to be taken here and now. So if we have an enlightened, scientifically based dialogue with those who run the coastal cities in most parts of the world, and we illustrate to them the cost involved and the risk involved, and if you in the insurance companies start increasing the premiums of people who live close to the sea in terms of insuring their houses and so on, the market will actually drive this transformation. It's not a question of believing, belief system or ideas. This is a hard, realistic view that people will follow if we present to them what is already the, the facts at the risk level. But somehow we are losing ourselves in a debate that, to me, was over some years ago. Now we have to start preparing for what's actually going to happen. Well, I mean, we, we, earlier when we were talking, so, I mean, we realized you know, there are kind of two discussions here. One is the developed, wealthy Western countries, and the other is the rest of the world. And that, in many ways, the questions play out quite differently. So, for instance, it wouldn't be, you know, I mean, in, already in Europe, you know, many countries have effectively de are decarbonizing in a fairly aggressive way. They can, you know, Holland can build dikes and Thames barriers. All this stuff can be done and is being done, as you say. Lots of the rest of the world basically can't afford to do either of those things, they would tell you. They would say, China will tell you, we can't afford right now to stop burning coal because we need cheap electricity to run our factories. And they'll also, other, you know, Bangladesh will say, we can't afford to put up, you know, flood barriers in the, in the Ganges Delta. So how do we square that, those two, we are all on the same planet sharing the same climate, and yet you have very misaligned interests. How do, how do you square that? Well, I think part one of the inconvenient truths, as President Crimson addressed earlier, is that the vulnerability of developing nations and emerging nations towards severe weather events is significantly higher compared to the industrial world. People in our regions here in Europe and North America are much easier able, they can afford to adapt to these right. changes. We can build stronger homes, we can remove our homes from risky places uh, and things like that. Those people living in uh, developing nations, they simply cannot afford. They don't have the resources, they don't have the know-how, and even if they would have the know-how, they wouldn't have the capability to finally move out of 
uh, the harm's way. So what, what actually needs to be done is we need to transfer our know-how, our knowledge on how to build, on, um, on uh, risky zones, flood zones and so, to these nations and help them adapting. By the way, insurance is one way of adapting to losses. At least it gives some relief after an event, but we have to go beyond this. Insurance is not the only solution. We need to help emerging countries, developing countries, to make their homes more resilient to these disasters which are on the rise. But I don't think it's just sharing the technology. It's about, an ec it's about economics. We're not adequately charging for the cost of carbon. We're not adequately looking into the future. You, we do the weather around the world, and, and you, you see these poor farmers, but all they know is this month. They hardly know this year. And the economics just don't add up. So at the end of the day, the challenge is we're not putting a price tag on stripping the planet. We're not putting a price tag on, on creating extreme weather. So they can feel it, they can get emotional about it, but until the, if the economics work right, China wouldn't need to have cheap fuel because it's, it's all about arbitrage. Well, if you look at what is happening in Europe and in China, we have a carbon pricing system called the ETS in Europe that is not really working because we didn't ever factor, factor a recession into it. But there are now seven low carbon economy zones in China with carbon pricing schemes. They are being linked to the European schemes, to the Australian schemes. So we're seeing some of these steps taken in the lack of a global deal. But Frankly, building global governance models that are dealing with that is just really, really hard. The one thing I think that we should not underestimate is the power of economies like Germany making radical decisions on going into a renewable-based uh, electricity system. Denmark going for offshore wind and, the, and, and not becoming poor. That's the key question, right? I mean, if we lose all our jobs, if we end up in a situation like Spain, then it's not a signal. But if in 2022 Germany is still such a lovely and pros prosperous place to live in, and we have 40, 50 percent renewables, it sends a strong signal that a low carbon economy is possible. So that's very, very important. And I personally believe that one of the best development, developmental aids Germany ever did for the whole world was the feed-in tariff for, for photovoltaics because it drove down the cost curve so much that nowadays you have basically economic deployment of photovoltaics in many places of the world as a result. Um, I was going to say we, we will be taking questions. Um, have we got mics for people? If, okay. Okay. Olaf, do you want to say something quick and then we'll take the questions? Well, I just want to draw the attention of everybody to the stand that Abu Dhabi has taken in the last five years on this issue. Abu Dhabi is, as we all know, a hugely wealthy country because of the oil. They, however, have realized that within 70 years their oil will run out, and if there is a rise of sea level of one or two meters, it will be an absolute disaster for, uh, for, the, for the entire country. So five or six years ago, they developed a vision and an investment strategy to get into clean energy in an aggressive way. And in five years, Abu Dhabi has become the largest runner of solar power in Spain, the large foreign investor in wind power in Britain. They are strategically investing in clean energy projects, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. They are interested in investing in urban heating system in Chinese cities that will close down the coal power stations. We are seeing within Europe, an oil-rich country like Abu Dhabi presenting one of the most aggressive clean energy investment portfolios that we have seen in Europe in recent years by a single investor. And if we don't pay attention to a wake-up call, market-driven, investment-driven by an oil-rich country like that, I don't really think we have then got our vision in terms of where our economy should be going in a correct way. Well, I was just going to ask, uh, do you think that some of this conversation is almost better led by the world cities that actually can make the move towards uh, actually dealing with the consequences of these things and, 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 and dealing with, uh, you know, how do you build flexible responses and, 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 and how do you start re rebuilding for populations that are going to deal with climate change rather than national governments that both take a longer view but in a way are more remote from the problem? Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, seven percent of all emissions globally come essentially out of cities. So that gives you a sense of the lever. And just also again coming back to China, 300 million people will move in the next 20 years into cities that haven't been built yet. So the lever of building efficient, energy efficient, resource efficient cities is huge. It'll make a big difference. And one follow up. This may be politically incorrect. Do you think we're focusing more on trying to uh, you know, are we focusing more on trying to reduce carbon and not enough on resiliency planning? Because in fact, if the problem's going to hit, we have to deal more with the fact that it's going to hit and therefore we have to respond? Well, uh, there, there's, as you know, this huge debate, mitigation versus adaptation, I think is missing the point. We should all go for resilient systems, like the internet is a resilient system. Once you kind of like look at it, what is an architecture that makes the energy system, the global kind of like also trade flow systems resilient, you come up with the right answers. The interesting point is the military has got it already. I mean, the English military has one of the highest ranking admirals focused on climate change. The CIA has working groups. The um, um, American military has wonderful insights. And they basically say, look, we got the choice as a society. Either we, we buy new aircraft carriers, battle groups one after another, to kind of safeguard all these um, world free trade routes, or we kind of start kind of making our systems more resilient vis-a-vis -vis climate change. So I think they, I mean, it's very interesting to talk to military people nowadays about this. And um, usually they are not the typical allies of the tree huggers, right? I, I would say it takes people understanding probabilities. And that's the hard part. We're in the middle of this now. We've lived through Andrew, we've lived through Katrina, we've lived through um, Irene. We've li people didn't want to close New York because it didn't hit New York last time, right? that had nothing to do with the probability of this time. So I think we've got to get better at teaching probabilities and knowing how to talk in probabilities in order to be resilient. I'm very worried. We're, not, we're rebuilding in ways that aren't resilient right now. Um, we have one up in the back, I think. Actually, well, Esther, why don't you? We only have one mic, I see. OK. 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 This poor guy, though. Yeah. <laughs> So, David, we, we heard Arkady Volos talking about CERN and physics and Large Hadron Collider. We heard Max Levchin talking about analog, big analog data. You presumably are using government weather data. Is there a way to develop algorithms that will actually be better than NOAA and people like that who are suffering from budget cuts and shortage of weather balloons and that kind of stuff? Yep. So we. We do that now because the, the, you start with the government data around the world, then we buy our own data. We've got 26,000 personal weather stations. I'm a big believer in crowdsourced weather for microclimates, so the, the whole weather underground system has been a real addition. We've got to keep adding. I, do, I think NOAA and the National Weather Service in the US, the UK Met Office, France Meteo, everybody's facing fiscal hits. I do believe that capital plays a role, and luckily we have a capital business that is based on that. But, but there is a reason that we had to buy our own data centers. There is a reason we're using cloud computing, and then we've got a couple hundred meteorologists. And the data shows it. It's, it's a better forecast. I think, there's a, I think there's a race to do a better forecast. It's a, it's a, it's a good commercial enterprise, and it's responsible to, the, to humanity. In the back. Yeah. Um, do you really think that a market-based solution is enough to deal with a problem which is mostly caused by our economic system reliance on eternal growth? Or do you think at some point we'll need to rely on more brutal policy measures? Like, I think an example of that is like uh, China's one-child policy, which for better or worse was maybe the most effective environmental legislation ever enacted. Yeah. I believe um, in the long run, a market-based solution like a global emission trading scheme would be the most efficient way to deal with the climate change issue. Putting a price tag on carbon uh, would be most efficient. I have my doubts, on the other hand, that processes like the Conference of the Parties, uh, the, the World Climate Conferences, we have just seen the last one closing uh, in, in Doha, in Qatar or so, basically without any concrete results, that this way of negotiating endlessly or so is not leading to, to very much or so. It was a kind of a first step introducing the Kyoto Protocol and uh, this has been extended now till the end of 2020, but nevertheless I, I have a hard time seeing this as being very efficient. Much more efficient would be 
putting a price tag, either a carbon tax uh, or a, another different form uh, on carbon, and that, that's a market mechanism, and everybody who uses carbon and burns carbon and emits carbon dioxide or so has to pay a certain price. And by the way, this also would address uh, the, the issue of being fair to developing nations. Typically, the developing nations are those countries which have the lowest CO2 emissions in the world. Here in, in the developed world, in, in Europe or so, we emit per capita about 10 tons a year or so. If you go to India, that's only some two tons or so. And that would be, by the end of the day, kind of a redistribution of, uh, of capital also and helping those in, in those parts of the world while we in the industrial world uh, would clearly understand and see what the real, the fair price is of our yeah. emissions. I, I have a simpler answer because it kind of is why I'm doing this. <laughs> Your guys are. Democracy and journalism have always gone hand in hand. I, I believe the problem is our voters aren't educated. And I think that there's a responsibility for us to tell the story in a way they can understand it. I'd be very wary of giving up on democracy to solve the climate. I think we've got to tell the story. So that leads to the question I was just about to ask, which is what can you point to that you guys have been doing that has been a broad-based and collective effort to educate people? Because you talk about the technology, you talk about what we have in terms of awareness, talk about some of the great ideas and initiatives that, that should be propagated where there's uh, governmental, where there's public and private partnerships and things of that nature. But is there anything you can point to on a tactical level from an educational standpoint? So, well, we're in the, the mass media side. What's worked for us is not to tell the climate story. It's like broccoli, it's good for you, but people don't like it. So what we do is in the moment of a weather story, we tell it. Sandy was important for New Yorkers. The drought was our bigger story. We covered the farm bill. We covered what the drought meant to farmers. We covered what they could do to prevent it this year, which was a part of it. We covered the wildfires. We covered the tornadoes. I think we're telling it in those moments. and. The data says that's where it's registering, when people can connect us to something in their lives right now. It seems to be a pretty colossal miscalculation that if you're just going for near-term small impact when you really know that the bigger impact is something that people need to better understand in order to mobilize activity both at the governmental and at the human level so that we can avoid tragedies and, and, and we can put the communities in a place where they can really prepare for the but, future. But you gotta it seems tell like you have a responsibility to address that in a more you know, co you know, courageous way. If they'll hear it, I think, I think it's when you can begin the dialogue. I think you, listen, I think it's just the reality of media. You've got to capture their attention when they're listening. Well, I can point at a couple of very tactical things. Um, and the answer is not that any of them are sufficient by themselves, but if you take them all together, and I'm just taking two now, um, it does build up to something like momentum. One is before um, Copenhagen uh, poli uh, policy um, uh, dialogue um, uh, in the COP, you had this email hack of the scientists um, on climate change. And they were kind of like basically using emails of the scientists out of context saying, look, the science is all wrong. You know? And the scientists didn't know how to defend themselves. So what we have done is we've trained scientists how to defend themselves when the media attacked them. So the second time it happened before Durban, they knew how to defend themselves and it turned around. Again, this is just one example where you have huge fossil fuel interests seeding doubt and you have to kind of defend the science. The other thing is, um, coming back to the investors, somebody has to pay for the new coal plant. And if you can make it clear that for health reasons, for climate reasons, for other reasons, for the longevity of the plant's life cycle, you don't want that coal plant effectively on the ground. You are already winning a battle, a plant at a time. And four or five years, there were 120 plant, plants, coal plant in Europe. Right now, 90 of them have been shelved. So something is happening. Well, in a few seconds, since I see the red light here, I spent more and more of my time in the last five to seven years explaining to people in different parts of the world that the reason why my country moved from being 80% re dependent on imported oil or coal over to being now for 20 years or so 100% clean energy in terms of all electricity production and all space heating was not a visionary policy because of climate change 
was not because of a grand national plan 30 or 40 years ago, but because of financial, business, household benefits for communities all over the country. It was driven by the economic sense of small communities and towns and different companies. It was entirely driven by economic motives. And one of the major reasons why my country, four years after the financial collapse, is back with one of the strongest economic growths in Europe, is because of the clean energy investments in the last 40 years. So the story of my country is that the clean energy transformation out of all is good business. Extraordinarily good business for the nation, for the communities, and for the families and the individuals. And if you want a risk policy against financial crisis in the future, and they will continue to happen because that's the nature of capitalism, do aggressive clean energy investments because it will be a monumental insurance policy against the fallback from a financial crisis in the future. And on that note from Iceland, thank you for a good audience and thank you, great panel.